Hey, before we get going, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, eToro. Let's talk about trading. Maybe your MO is just stacking sats once a week, or you're one of those cowboy altcoin traders who go deep into technical analysis. I don't know. Maybe you're just a muggle and you're trying to get into this whole cyber cash thing. Maybe you actually do want to put some skin in the game, but you have no idea where to begin. Now there's one trading app for all of that. eToro. It's a trading platform and mobile app that lets you buy and sell cryptocurrency. And it's also the number one social trading platform in the world. Listeners, you might even be asking, what the hell is a social trading platform? Copy trading is a feature that lets you mirror the actions of top traders on the platform. This way, you can learn about due diligence and all the other technical things it might take months to pick up on your own just by copying the behavior of the top traders on the platform. So head over to eToro.com and get started on your portfolio today eToro, smart crypto trading made easy. Hey guys, welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I'm Dave. Today I wanted to share this really great interview that our staff writer, Vlad Kostia, got with Bruce Fenton. So Bruce is one of the earliest adopters of Bitcoin, and he's still a really big presence in the space. Vlad goes into an intro, explains all that. I just want to say Bruce does a really good job in this interview of reminding us all what's so cool about working in the space, technology and the people. I just like really appreciated this interview, and I just wanted to echo it by publishing it on our podcast. But a big area that's seen a lot of promise in the last couple of months is lending and borrowing. Our show sponsor, the Celsius Network, is one of these types of companies. The TLDR version of it is, The Celsius Network lets you earn interest on your crypto and instantly borrow against it. And there are no fees. Ever. There are more than 50,000 active wallets using their services. And right now, they're offering users 10% annual interest on their crypto deposits. That's right, I kid you not, 10% annual interest on crypto deposits. That's not only unheard of in the traditional banking industry, it's also a pretty good deal from a crypto company. And right now, the Celsius Network is giving our listeners, you guys, $10 in BTC when you make a deposit of $200 or more dollars in crypto or stable coins by using the promo code BitcoinMag. Again, the promo code is BitcoinMag. Check out their website today. Again, thanks so much to Vlad for getting this. Here's the interview. Hello, and welcome to this Bitcoin Magazine interview. I am Vlad, and my guest is Bruce Fenton, who is the CEO of Chainstone Labs and has been for a long time involved into the Bitcoin space and has a lot of knowledge and financial involvement, so skin in the game. And I'm glad to have him here. So hello, Mr. Fenton. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. So you got in the Bitcoin space in 2012, right? Yes. And that was seven years ago, roughly. Right. <laughs> so you have been involved in the Bitcoin Foundation as a director. You also had your points of view in various points of Bitcoin's development and how the narrative was being regarded. And you made it this far. And you're still involved and you still find some kind of satisfaction probably in being involved in Bitcoin. So how has this ride been so far? It's been a wild ride. Uh, I, wouldn't ch- I wouldn't trade it for the world. I've joked with friends that even if it all just fell apart and went to zero somehow, we would still probably meet up and get together. Um, you know, I'd still probably host the Stoji Roundtable. Maybe it'd be at a, at a hotel. If nobody had any money, maybe it'd be at a, at a Motel 6 or something. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. I think it's been really intellectually stimulating and never-ending fascination. Uh, so many interesting people, interesting passions. Uh, it's, it's just really exciting. And I've, I've been able to learn a lot. I think anybody who gets into this, some people come from, from computer science, some people come from law or whatever. You know, I've heard it said that you need to kind of master, you know, nine different sets of knowledge to understand Bitcoin. And nobody comes in with all nine of them. I had some of the finance and economics ones, but I was lacking on some of the computer science and, and open source uh, knowledge sets. So I learned a lot about those kind of things you know, the nature of open source and cypherpunk values and these kind of things. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. I think that's been really exciting and really fun. 
Yeah, I think what I appreciate uh, about Bitcoin OGs is that they always say that even if the coins went to zero in terms of valuation, they would still support the project and find something interesting in it. And developers would possibly still do cool stuff with the protocol. And this is something that you don't find in other projects. They have all sorts of expectations and financing and VCs. And unless they meet some kind of goals, they're not going to be around and nobody's going to care much about them. Yeah, that's huge. It's, it's really one of the, the I mean, it's, it's got to be the most powerful open source, in my opinion, the most powerful and, and important open source project out there. And that's the power of open source is because there's no metric saying that, you know, okay, Satoshi raised X and it's got to deliver X by, you know, fourth quarter, whatever. Um, it's just volunteers. Everybody contributes in their own way. Even people like me who, who don't know how to code uh, can still contribute by talking about it and increasing awareness and building on top of it. And, and look at what we've created. I mean, it's, it's, it's just this massive, massive industry. You, you have something like 800 uh, contributors to the core um, uh, GitHub uh, repository, but that's just scratching the surface. There's hundreds and hundreds of other engineers on second layer stuff and wallets and things like that. And there's thousands of executives and promoters and authors of books and everything like that. Um, so it's, it's really exciting uh, to show the, the, you know, the power that an all volunteer system can do. You know, Bitcoin belongs to all of us. So it's, it's for everybody to kind of you know, build together. And, and that's worked out you know, pretty amazingly. I don't think there's anything like it. When you first got into Bitcoin, there wasn't so much stuff around. You didn't have books. You didn't have podcasts. There were just a bunch of forum threads that you could read. But other than that, what was the main point or the main advantage or main quality of Bitcoin that made you throw away your previous career? I think it was at Morgan Stanley and decide to just go all in into Bitcoin. Yeah, it was really scary. So I had been at Morgan Stanley and then I started my own firm, Atlantic Financial, which is a successful firm. We had some very large, high profile clients, some of the wealthiest institutions in the world. And we're, you know, doing, you know, very healthy, uh, you know, revenue in the millions. And, and I had pretty high compensation. And I really did throw it all away. I mean, I canceled all of my, you know, my income went from a very high income to basically no income. And, uh, and it wasn't like now where there's all kinds of speculation and startups and funding rounds and things like that. There was nobody with funding when I first started. Um, Coinbase and BitPay were some of the very early ones several months after I started and they were doing really small rounds. So there was no real VCs, there wasn't lawyers, there wasn't any of this kind of thing. Um, so it was a big risk. And I, I think what attracted me at first was just the the electric excitement to go to these events. Uh, the first couple of events I went to really were life changing because it was just this weird eclectic mix of you know strange people and hackers and just real characters, uh, anarchists and and but a lot of real geniuses, really brilliant people that I quickly could tell that they really knew their stuff and they were excited about it. That got me excited about it. And then as I learned more, it took me, I was a slow learner, especially on this kind of cyberpunk open source stuff. It took me kind of six months to really understand. I, I kept, I came from a world where everything was about authorities. So I kept trying to figure out who's the leader and how can I, how can I get, how can I get in with the people who are running this thing? And then I realized that it, it belongs to everybody. And that was a big mind shift coming from, you know, the world, you know, in my previous job, I, I was dealing with kings and, and, and uh, you know, cabinet ministers and billionaires all the time. I was really lucky, which helped me get a, an insight to how the world works a little bit. Those roles are still important in their own rights, but open source is an entirely different kind of thing. And I, and I thought at first that this sort of mantra of saying, you know, oh, there's no leaders, there's nobody in charge. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, it sounds like a politician saying, you know, we want more freedom or something. You don't really believe it until you you experience it so th at first it was just kind of the electric excitement and then later it was understanding like wow this is really something different and understanding that it could do something that you couldn't do before you know to to not need a trusted third party uh took a little bit of time to sink in but once i realized that i said wow that's that's really powerful you can you can find out what's true and you don't need any central authority to tell you what's true you can rely on your peers to tell you what's true 
So uh, yeah, that's what got me excited about it. So do you think that your involvement with the Bitcoin Foundation was mostly due to your previous job and your understanding of the world and possibly you wanted Bitcoin to be somewhat political? Not really. I think that's a fair criticism. And I understand people that, you know, do have criticism of the foundation. The foundation is an interesting animal because, um, you know, it evolved a lot over, over time. In the very early days before I joined, um, you know, there was, there's probably some valid criticism. Some people I'm sure wanted to kind of make it a, you know, like an official organization that's in charge or something like that. Uh, but there was also some work to say, you, you know, there was, there was no, um, you didn't have a lot of people like Andreas who were sort of speaking for Bitcoin. There was, you know, the media was just learning about this and they were looking, you know, who can we talk to? Um, and, you know, so it did serve some good, you know, uses as a convening point. As far as my involvement, I, I had been, um, uh, one of my clients was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I was active with charity. I learned a lot about charity. They give away $10 million a day or so. And that's another organization that, I, you know, I'm well aware a lot of people have different criticisms of. And I have some of my own. But overall, they do quite a bit of good. They have no doubt about it, saved millions of lives. Um, so they give, you know, eight, or eight, eight to $12 million a, a day away to various charities. So I learned a lot about nonprofits. And there is a, a value of nonprofits. Nonprofits can do things that um, there just isn't, it doesn't make financial sense to do. That's the nature of a nonprofit where there's just no economic uh, benefit of somebody fighting a certain fight or doing an educational initiative or something like that. So I, I like the idea of nonprofits and, uh, and that's something that's good about the foundation. There was some good things. When I was there, uh, I think we did some good things with education. One of the, the best things was probably the DevCore um, uh, education series. So for a very small amount of money or free, if you're a student, you could go and learn from, uh, you know, we had some really great people, you know, uh, Blue Matt and uh, Greg Maxwell and Gavin Andreessen and Charlie Lee and these kind of people would teach uh, about, about Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, it was, it's interesting. It's certainly a learning experience. I think the organization overall definitely had its ups and downs. It's, it's hard in a decentralized space to have a centralized organization. And it's a valid question to ask, you know, do you even have one? And I think the Bitcoin Foundation, because it was so early and so high profile, had a lot more pressure on it. I've had a lot of people say, you know, well, what have you done kind of thing, which they wouldn't maybe do as much for another organization. If just five friends said, hey, we're going to make an educational series, everybody would say, hey, great. But if it's under the Bitcoin Foundation, banner, I think it might get a little more uh, skepticism and a little bit more, um, you, you, you know, criticism. Um, but I, I understand that, you know, I do because, because it, it does sound like a centralized organization. Uh, but the most important thing I think with Bitcoin and open source is that the foundation never, even when it was paying the main developers like Vladimir, um, they didn't exercise authority, and this was before my time, but they didn't exercise authority to tell Vladimir what to write in the code. Uh, and that's important. And even if they did, uh, what really um, regulates Bitcoin is is what the code people decide to use. So even if you had a foundation that was really powerful and you somehow paid the developers and said, okay, change the code and make it 22 million coins and give me a million, it's just never going to fly. You know, any even even something, a fraction as, as controversial of that, as that is never, you look at now, you know, even the sm smallest movements, um, are very controversial. That's good. That's the way it should be. Uh, so, so yeah, it was definitely an interesting experience. I, I, I suppose, um, you know, not not perfect, but uh, I'm probably glad that I, I'm probably glad I did it overall. I don't, I don't know. It wasn't, wasn't. I got a lot of uh, a lot of hard time from working with the foundation, but um, you know, I'm proud of what we of what we accomplished when I was there. Yeah, I think it was also an important early lesson for Bitcoin in general. As if we had this type of experiment now, it would be a lot worse because the community has grown and you have many more miners and more nodes. The protocol is clearly more decentralized than it was in 2013, 2014. And even with the congressional hearings that we have seen with Mark Zuckerberg testifying for Libra and what's the name of the Libra project director? Marcus? Yes. 
even him, he has been under a lot of scrutiny. And I feel like Bitcoin has gotten away from all this because it managed to be truly decentralized. If the foundation was still big and the leaders of the main exchanges were board members, like it was in 2014 with Charlie Schramm and Roger Veer and all the others, then I guess there would be a lot more questioning about the nature of Bitcoin. But yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. You know, a lot of people have speculated early on. I had some people say, well, it's great that there's a foundation because it's a lightning rod. If you have regulators, they're going to go to the foundation first because they think it's a centralized organization, which is sort of true. Um, you know, the foundation got all kinds of crazy letters in the early days from, you know, they got a cease and desist from the state of California saying, you know, stop all Bitcoin and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff like this because they, you know, people just didn't know better and they assumed that it was, um, you know, it was this centralized organization. People would also go to the foundation and say, hey, you know, somebody uh, uh, hacked me or they, they bribed me and they wanted a bounty. I want my Bitcoin back. Um, but now nobody would make those mistakes because everybody, you know, even the mainstream media knows that you don't have anybody who has any, any sort of centralized power over that. Um, and it is, it, it would be a drawback if they were, if they were, you know, bringing, you know, I, I'm never a fan of being brought in front of congressional hearings over Bitcoin. Um, there's always somebody willing to do it because everybody wants that kind of publicity. But if I ever was asked to testify on Bitcoin, I would just say, you know, it's an idea and it, the idea is expressed in code and it was given away. So tough, you know, it's, it's it, people have a right to write down ideas People have to write to express those in code. They have a right to, to give those away and they have a right to run them on a computer. And if that computer generates some weird digital widget thing called a Bitcoin, tough. That's nobody's business and nobody has any authority to mess with that. That's that, especially in the United States, that's just the core of free speech. And you know, one thing I've, I've done, you know, even with the foundation is, is sort of push that issue. Uh, Plattsburgh, New York, for example, tried to make a ban on mining uh, you know, any commercial mining defined as, you know, three or more mining devices. And I wrote a letter. I said, well, if I come in there with three Raspberry Pis and I'm running Bitcoin on a solar powered thing, are you going to, you know, you're going to charge us for that? You have free speech um, and you don't really have a right to, to do it. So if you had the right person in a congressional hearing, you could, you know, you could make some progress. I think it's better if they don't even have anybody to bring in, in, in front of it. Don't even have anybody to ask. And I've always been against, um, companies and organizations, and there's a lot of them in our space, they mean well, but they, they go out and say, oh, we want regulatory clarity. So they go to the regulators and they come out with model laws or they'll ask the regulators for participation. I, I don't believe in that, I, I, especially with Bitcoin. Um, securities are a little different, but with Bitcoin, I would say, uh, you know, you just go with the attitude of, you know, this is free speech. You have a right to write and, and, and publish code and you have a right to run code on your computer Full, full stop. You know, that's it. Uh, so that's the kind of ad advocacy I'd like to see. And I, I, I would like it to see if there was some organization like that. I don't know if it's the Bitcoin Foundation or some other organization. I'd like to see somebody, you know, be a little bit more, you know, kind of fighting the system with lawsuits and, you know, bringing these up on free speech cases or something like that. Right. And nowadays we see this wave of the so-called Bitcoin maximalism movement. And a lot of people just deny the significance or the purpose of anything else that is not Bitcoin and they say basically it should not exist and serves no purpose and has no point unless it runs on top of Bitcoin, which is legit from maybe a long term investment point of view, as we don't know if anything else will exist in 10 years except for Bitcoin. And it's also cautious in terms of network effects. As I don't believe, personally, I don't believe Ethereum will be around for such a long time because it already has too many factions and seems to go into directions that are, are not part of the original plan. And these plans tend to change during one of their foundation meetings, which to me just means that there's a lot of centralization, which is un, not, not desirable for this space. And my criticism for maximalism is that it turns into a cult and people act like cult members and they read the same books, they listen to the same podcasts, they talk the same, which can be good for adoption, for spreading awareness. But on the other hand, it can look like we are just crazy people trying to do something 
that normies will not be interested in. What's your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I agree. Um, I think I've, I've always tried to, I went to a small high school where they, we didn't have cliques like a lot of high schools. We only had, uh, you know, small classes. And particularly, I got picked on a lot when I was in junior high. So the way that I got around that, I just worked really hard to try and be, uh, you know, have more friends, basically, by the time I was older. And so I was the person who was friends with the jocks and the nerds and the class president and the you know, the, the, the geeks and the computer lab. And, you know, I was trying to be friends with everybody and that carried on, you know, later in my life, I ended up doing work in the Middle East where there's, all, you know, right after 9-11, there's all kinds of misconceptions. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of work trying to, you know, have people increase understanding about Islam, uh, different things like that. And, and so in my nature, I try and you know, make more friends than enemies in this in this space. I, I hope that's something I'm known for. I, I I try and do events and things like that that have a variety of people. So I don't like closing off, uh, you know, doors to people. I think that's one drawback. Although I consider myself a maximalist, it really depends who you're talking to. You know, the, a lot of the people who consider themselves sort of pure maximalists, they think I'm a, you, you know, like not a maximalist at all. But then other people on another side, like, oh, you know, Bruce is just way too into Bitcoin. You're not open-minded about things. So it's kind of funny from, the, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, with politics, you could have one side or the other who both think you're part of the other side. Um, but I'm a maximalist in the sense that I believe, you know, certainly Bitcoin is by far the strongest chain, most secure chain, uh, by far the best chance of being global money. And really, you know, the only coin that can do quite what it's trying to do in an effective way. Uh, but I do think that some of the other projects, they're trying to do something different that may not have the security needs that Bitcoin has. Um, and I'm cautious about doing anything that turns people off, particularly if you get too clicky, like you say, if you, you know, you speak your own language and you, you sort of uh, push people away. Uh, you want to recognize there's all kinds of people that we're going to want to participate in this. Um, but there's some benefits that that sort of, you know, the, the hodler of last resort attitude who just has a no compromising thing. I, I like that those people are helping to protect my Bitcoin and keep my Bitcoin valuable. So some of the real militant uh, maximalists, I can kind of roll my eyes and say, oh, they're not being that diplomatic, but eh, you know, they're also protecting my Bitcoin because I know they're just never going to compromise on stuff. I don't, I don't lose sleep at night worrying somebody's going to mess with the code. Uh, because I know that there's people who will, I, I think there's people who will give their life for Bitcoin, as crazy as that is, I think there are people, I mean, I care a great, great deal about it, but I think there's people who, um, you know, really for them, it, it, it is, it's, all, it's like a religion or anything else. And I say that in a, in a, you know, kind of a good way because they are protecting this network. Uh, but, you know, like, like any religion or, or, you know, click like that, there are some drawbacks. So um, I think it's good if people can try and understand uh, you know, understand other opinions. And, and, you know, I always try and say, you know, think about it if you're at a cookout and you just ran into somebody, you know, if you're on Twitter and you're a maximalist and somebody's talking about Ethereum, you, you're going to, you know, you might butt heads. But if you met that person at a cookout, you probably, you know, you, you might be the only two people at the whole cookout that talk, that understand crypto at all. So you're going to have more in common than the other hundred guests. Even if on Twitter, you're mortal enemies, um, you, you still might, have more in common. And, and that's why it's so great to meet people. I've been really fortunate to meet so many people in this, in this space. And that combined with my kind of life experience, I think makes, makes it so I'm a little bit more, you know, hopefully forgiving and, you know, trying to, trying to make friends rather than enemies, uh, you know, but, but uh, there's benefits and drawbacks of, 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 of it, uh, you know, the way it is, I guess there's not much we could do to change it. Right. Yeah, speaking of making friends, I know that you organize this Satoshi Roundtables and some people on Twitter seem to not like the concept and say it's some kind of obscure and mystical meeting where people plan things that the others are not allowed to know. So what are they like and who can participate in the Roundtables? Yeah, it's, it's um, so one misconception is that it's it's closed. It's it's not closed. It's that it's really limited in space. So just from the reality of of logistics, um, you know, we've got just a couple hundred seats, 
And so, yeah, there is some sort of, I mean, if Brian Armstrong asks for a seat, he's going to get a seat because he runs a very, very important company. Uh, same with pretty much any core developer who is an active contributor to Bitcoin Core. They're all going to get a seat. Uh, you know, but it's not like, the, the, you know, people are pushed away unless there's, you know, a really good reason. Like if they're, like we have a no pitch policy. So if somebody comes one year and they pitch everybody, they're not, they, they, you know, they're not going to get a seat the next year. But I've tried hard and I, I definitely recognize the kind of, you know, because it's limited in space, if I just let everybody come, then we'd end up like a thousand people would be just like consensus. And the whole purpose of it is to do something not like consensus, mainly because that's not the, I, the event that I kind of prefer. It's a little too noisy and busy. Uh, and also just the logistics, you know, I'd need a lot more staff and it's a different uh, cost structure to do a big event like that. I'd need sponsors. We haven't typically had sponsors. Um, so it's just sort of the format. It's, it's kind of like, um, there's a lot of dinner, there's dinner meetings going on right now in New York tonight with uh, Consensus Invest. It's like a dinner meeting, you know, they're, they're, they're private um, because, you know, usually limited in space and the economics. And I, I pay up front for the round table um, ahead of time. And it's not typically a very profitable thing because you know, the model is that there's no sponsorships really. Um, but, uh, you know, overall it's designed to be sort of very high signal to noise ratio, really good conversations, good breakaway sessions. We do a very decentralized uh, format. So it's an unconference style. So people can, can go and break into the sessions they want. They can talk about Lightning Network or side chains or whatever. I mean, last year was great because you had sort of a couple different very Bitcoin maximalist groups that ended up gravitating to, together. You know, they're just going to, uh, and and some of these people have, you know, pub the other thing is we try and respect privacy, which is which is sometimes mistaken for secrecy, which is kind of funny because this space is all about privacy. You know, year one and two, uh, you know, we really had to worry about privacy. I mean, we we have pretty good reason to believe that our bags were run through in I think it was year two, where a whole bunch of bags were diverted to Washington DC of all places and they showed up like two days later. It just, it was, it was too weird and too coincidental. But in any event, whether it's right or wrong, there are some people who want privacy. So we try and, you know, uh, have the media be in a separate section and you let people talk frankly in a private way. Uh, and there's good reason for that. You know, like if, if, if somebody's saying, I think this person might be a scam, but I'm not sure. That's not something you, if you're a CEO, you're not going to necessarily want to say that on Twitter because you could end up hurting somebody's name when they don't deserve it. But it is something you might say in private or you might say, you know, gee, our investors are on our back or, you know, we, we're not sure if we're going to make payroll or whatever. These are things that, that, that CEOs and developers or other people, they're things that they may want to discuss privately. So we try and have the, you know, the privacy, but some of these people have, have uh, you know, revealed themselves, you know, or talked about it, you know, you can talk about it yourself. Um, and, you know, they gravitated towards their own sort of uh, interests. So you had a whole bunch of maximalists in maximalist meetings, and then you had people across, you know, on the other side of the venue talking about entirely different topics. And, th and that, that's kind of what we try and foster. Uh, is, and, and the other thing we're trying to do is we, we have this farm in New Hampshire. We're trying to do, um, we just did one like uh, a few weeks ago. We're trying to do more open kind of community style events that use that same sort of unconference uh, style with, with just, you know, people talking about what they want and it organically unfolds in a, in a decentralized way. So I, I think it's a good event. People tend to like it. Uh, it's not perfect. We're always trying to improve it as far as, um, you know, getting it more inclusive and, and ha having more people be able to participate. It is a high priority all the time. So if anybody wants to come, you know, they can always reach out and, and would, you know, We'll, we'll try and make room for anybody, especially if somebody hasn't come before and they're, you know, they're not pitching some scam or something like that. You know, they, they, you know, the more the merrier. Is there any kind of elitistic threshold? As that's also a criticism for the roundtable that you have to have what? been around some kind of threshold, like you have to have been around for at least five years or something to participate, or to not have had really. some kind it's, of involvement. It's sort of you know, we had kind of, I mean, we, the, the big thing that we've tried to work with is how do we fairly allocate this space? We have 200 seats. How do we do that? We've tried, we've, you know, it's in our sixth year now. So we've kind of tried everything. We did sort of first couple of years was kind of like invitation only. 
we did one where we just sort of opened it and said, okay, first come, first serve. But that's problematic because sometimes the, you know, it's a shame if it fills, fills up and then there's, you know, a really accomplished developer or CEO or investor or something who, do, who just doesn't have time to register early on. Um, and we've never kicked anybody out to make room for somebody else, that's for sure. But we always try and make room for the people who are going to add the most to the conversation. And that, that's, a, that's a big metric. How, how, how do you know who's going to add the most? It could be, um, you know, we try and have a diverse group. So sometimes, um, you, you know, like one year we had no lawyers. So I went and called a few lawyers and say, hey, you got to come. Then one year we had, wait, like a whole bunch of lawyers. So I was sort of like, oh, we need more developers now. So I called some of my friends who are developers. And, you know, we try and even it out. If somebody is interesting, like a voice that you haven't heard from, somebody from another country that isn't usually represented, they could be brand new to the industry, like a new startup, or if somebody, just somebody interesting, um, like William Shatner is coming this year. He, I think, found out about it through somebody who had attended a few times. They said, you know, he has an interest in crypto. He's been talking about crypto a bit on his Twitter. And one of the attendees said, hey, you ought to come to this. He's not like a, a paid guest or anything. He's just attending. And so Shatner is not, doesn't have some huge street cred when it comes to to, to Bitcoin coding, but he's, he's just an interesting person. He has an interesting life. He's a celebrity. So, you know, the, you know, the, and there's a couple people like that, you know, there's different celebrities and stuff that have come. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really hard. Uh, you, you know, it's kind of a judgment call. We, we tried to have sort of a, a criteria to like, okay, if you're, if you have a startup with X funding or you're a core developer of one of the major five protocols or whatever, but it's, it's more just kind of, um, you, you know, you play it by ear. The good news is, I mean, I don't want to make it out like it's just so, so popular that you have all these people just trying to beat down the door. It does tend to be oversubscribed. But, you know, if, if you're, if you're uh, you know, if you're interesting or, you know, have some kind of interesting background, certainly some metrics are easy. Like if you have, a, say, a $100 million company that you're CEO of that's a Bitcoin-focused company, uh, you you know you you sort of you know we're going to try and figure out a way to make a space same same if you're like a top ten core developer in on on Bitcoin um, there's certain people that are kind of obvious uh, but but uh, you know the less obvious ones you know I, I think we've done a pretty good job um, you know in almost all cases people we, we especially if they're early on uh, you know not the last minute you know we try and make room and. And figure out a way to 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 make it as as diverse and interesting as possible. But it's hard. It's it's a hard job. If anybody has, I get a lot of criticism for it. But if anybody has a simple, easy, fair way to do it, um, you know, it's easy to say like, oh, just you know, do it first come first serve or whatever. But but we've kind of tried all those, and and it you know, it's all about the attendees. We want the people who come. We're really lucky that a lot of a lot of you know really interesting people come. We want them to enjoy it. You know, we want them. So I take a lot of their feedback. And the biggest thing is if, if somebody who's attended, especially a regular attendee, uh, has a recommendation, almost always those people, uh, you know, we make room for those people. So if somebody says, hey, you know, this is this tiny startup you've never heard of before, or this person is a real, you know, brilliant whiz, they just got into it, or is really interesting, you know, we've had all kinds of, of interesting people. Some of them aren't even super, you know, known for crypto. They're just really interesting people for other areas. And that kind of adds to the overall, um, you know, making the event more interesting and successful, I think. Let's change the topic a bit and go back to 2015, 2017, when we have had that ugly scaling debate, which started with, with maybe the acknowledged leader of the time, Gavin Andreessen, when he made BIP 101 and proposed to scale the blocks according to a plan that he made. And it was an entire process of removing leaders and establishing that nodes are more important than miners. And I guess to everybody involved, it was a learning process because we thought that miners were a lot more important than they actually were. We had some misconceptions about what Bitcoin can do and cannot do. There was a lot of skepticism regarding the Lightning Network. There was skepticism about side chains because until Liquid was launched a year ago, there was no major project which demonstrated that the concept can actually work. So how many times have you actually changed your stance during this time period? 
Um, I think I was pretty careful to not be too strong about taking a stance. I was definitely uh, open-minded to the point of annoying people, I think. I open-minded to the point of almost having a stance. You know, I, I was kind of arguing both sides of the issue. And I argued for kind of the, if you have sort of the NYA sort of corporate side versus the developer side, I kind of more, most of the time probably argued the corporate side. I didn't, I don't think I went so far as to, and in certain things, like I definitely didn't support the NYA and I, I didn't support it, but I sort, sort of argued on that side, partly because I was learning myself and I was, I still hadn't made up my mind. Uh, and partly because I think that one of my strengths, especially coming from the corporate world, one of my strengths is kind of, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I've, I've been a salesperson and kind of a debater sort of person. So, so I, I think I have a strength in taking other people's opinion, trying to put them in a way that I can sort of argue a case for somebody else. So um, in the very early days, when it first began, like a lot of people, I just couldn't understand why, you know, why can't you just fix it? You know, just get together and compromise and fix it. But a lot of the people from more of the strong development side, people like Adam Back, uh, he's probably the best example. And he was very kind to spend a lot of time with me and people like me. Uh, I remember one time we spoke on the phone for like, three and a half hours one time and he, and he was just trying to explain to me and convince me you know what's different about open source and why this works and he and him and other people like that eric lombroso is another one uh jameson law uh, you know people who came from a different world than i did really informed my opinion quite a bit and then i would go back to kind of the corporate people and say okay here's Here's why this is important because it's all about security. If we let security become weak, then nothing else matters, kind of thing. Uh, Nick Sabo is another one um, that you know, mainly from his readings. I, uh, I haven't spent tons of time with him, but uh, you, you know, listening to these people who really have this, uh, you know, sort of security first attitude, I, I'm convinced, and that's the way that I ended up falling on it. Um, but because of you know, sort of arguing it so much in the early days, sometimes, thank God I'd never signed that, <laughs> that New York agreement. You never hear the end of it. Um, and I didn't support it, but I do, I think the difference between me and a lot of other people is that I, I think I have more sympathy and more understanding because I, I do understand very much the, the other side of it, the kind of Coinbase side of it, which was they were envisioning a split being very bad, you know, a, a, um, a chain fork, and now we've got a bunch of chain forks, but we didn't know what was going to happen at the time. Uh, so that, that was really like, wow, you know, this is so early. If this splits and there's two Bitcoin, people are going to be confused about which one. That was something there was a lot of uh, fear about because it was unknown. And then also just sort of the usability, you know, for right or wrong, a lot, a lot of people came into Bitcoin. And I think some would say that it was, you know, wrong. Uh, it was misconceptions that, that Bitcoin was supposed to be free or almost free, very fast method of uh, payment. And uh, if you remember the early days, 2012, 13, it was all about merchants. You know, I got my local coffee house and I got, you know, we have Tiger Direct and this company and that company who are accepting it. And that's what everything was about. So when fees, I, you know, I remember one time Roger Veer gave a speech. He's like, we're going to be paying, if this continues, it's going to be 30 cents for a fee. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, 30, 30 cents. That would, that'll just wreck, wreck Bitcoin. At least some people thought that. There was other people who said, no, 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 that was never what the point of Bitcoin was. Um, and you've got to be careful about kind of rewriting history sometimes too. There's, you know, you don't want to just go too far to the store of value side. But um, I think my opinions were really evolving on that. It was, you know, very interesting learning experience. I'm really glad I, I have a, I had a front row seat. I mean, I'm definitely not the smartest guy in this space by any uh, by any long shot. There's so many really smart people, but one thing that I that I am really thankful for is that I've had a good seat to uh, you know something that's just as interesting as any movie or Game of Thrones episode in the world. And I and I did get to sit in a lot of these meetings. You know, we we had uh, meetings that I was involved with and phone calls and things like that. And I'm good friends with with folks on all different sides, you know, I, I, I like um, a lot of people from the different sides of this complex issue. Uh, and I'm really, really thankful for that. But, 
you know, overall, I, I think that most people were trying to do the right thing, I guess would be my, my biggest takeaway. Um, I came out one particular way. I happen to sort of agree with the Bitcoin maximalist, um, you know, don't change, you know, keep the security first. But, uh, you know, I respect the other people on the other sides, too. So how do you feel about the fact that we had a chain split and now the big blockers have a blockchain of their own to experiment with the big blocks? I think it's good overall. I mean, I, I think that I, I'm not a big fan of trying to use the name Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's a little hard to say, okay, this is the real Bitcoin. No, that's the real Bitcoin. I mean, it'd be really clean and easy if you just, I, and I think it would probably be more successful if they would have just called it Bitcash. And, you know, th this is a fork of Bitcoin and here's, here's the thing. I mean, you know, I'm talking about Bitcoin Cash. For Bitcoin SV, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not even a fan of kind of using the Satoshi name. Uh, we're trying to decrease the Satoshi name for the Satoshi Roundtable for a similar reason. You know, when the name came out, it was kind of abstract, like Sats or something like that. But, but that's another issue. But, um, you know, forks are great because, you know, both chain forks and code forks, because that's the nature of open source. Everybody can have their own ideas and everybody can run their own thing. Um, and I do believe that almost all of these projects help Bitcoin uh, because if anything, you know, you can learn what doesn't work. You can, it can inspire Bitcoin to be more competitive in certain, certain things. Uh, and there's always going to be some group, usually a minority group that just wants to do something different. Uh, they're going to want their own method of account or whatever. And that's just the nature of the world. I don't buy this idea that everybody's all going to agree on one thing. We've seen that already. So I think the forks are, are, are good in the sense that it's a learning experience and there's, you know, there's people that just might not for whatever reason, might not be interested in contributing to Bitcoin or building on Bitcoin. And it's free and it's free and it's open source. So the nature of the software license is that anybody can do anything with it and they can try it and run their own code. And if they have something that's worthwhile and, and has market value over time, then that'll be good. If not, then it's a learning experience. So I'm not, I'm not against those. And I don't buy the argument that having lots of people contribute to other projects is a drain on Bitcoin because you, you know, I mean, the Ethereum community, for example, is so different in many ways. A lot of those people just wouldn't be contributing at all. It's not like all those thousands of people would be involved in Bitcoin if they weren't. It's like they are maybe have different interests, different things that they're doing. Um, and hopefully the overall ecosystem benefits from that. You know, some, some of the projects may not benefit the Bitcoin ecosystem, but I think overall Bitcoin is better now um, than it would have been if for the last four years, say, you didn't, you didn't have any of these projects, you know. Right. Now, let's shift the point of discussion to privacy. As you have mentioned before, that privacy is important during Satoshi Roundtable meetings. So what is your stance in regards to Bitcoin privacy? And I guess you have multiple layers for sending privacy, receiving privacy, protocol level privacy with Tor and stuff, and sometimes wallets fix that. But I suppose that after the scaling debate, has settled and we have had lightning, it just opened the gates for privacy conversations and whether or not we want confidential transactions or we want to move our Bitcoins to side chains or mix them or do stuff like that. What do you think about privacy in Bitcoin? I think it's really, really important. Um, I think from a computer science standpoint, there's a lot of people with sort of similar technical skills to me, which is like, you know, I'm a, I'm a big techie compared to your average person on the street, but, but I'm a fool compared to somebody who's a real developer. Um, so a lot of these things should be left to the, you, you know, a lot of the more advanced discussions on the, the implementation of these things is it's more of a, uh, you know, more technical, but from a, you know, overall priority standpoint, I think that privacy should be way, way, way up there. Uh, I, I suppose security has got to be always first, but privacy, I, you know, I would put maybe number two, three, something like that. There's probably smarter people than me to ask on that, but I think privacy is really important. And I think that it, it to me, what Bitcoin is um, fits really well with privacy. I, I, I view the Cypherpunk Manifesto as kind of the 
origin and, and soul of what Bitcoin is. Um, and, and, I, and that, it's a short paper, but it's all about privacy. And it was written even before we have these concerns that we have now. It was written before we worried about everything we know about Snowden and China and the United States and, and the NSA and everything. Um, not to mention corporations, you know, Target and uh, the VA and everybody else who leaks your records. Uh, you have people actively spying on you. And you also have people just active, you know, voluntarily giving out uh, information. I've become a fan of TikTok lately because I think it's a great next uh, generation platform. The power of these very short videos is very powerful, but the amount of information they're going to know about people, it's, it's just stunning. They're going to know what your favorite color is, what kind of person you're attracted to, what kind of car you like. You know, over time, if, if people are watching hours of, of short videos and they're, they're, you know, skipping some and liking others, uh, that's very powerful data. So I'm, I'm very, very cautious about privacy in this digital world. And that was envisioned in the cypherpunk manifesto and some of these other early works some science fiction and other things. So I think for Bitcoin to, you know, live up to its vision, pri privacy has got to be a huge, huge priority. And so any, you know, it's, it's always tricky, anything in the core protocol, uh, you want to be very, very cautious about messing with it. And especially, you know, I don't even know if anything that requires a hard fork is even that practical. Um, because anything that's at all controversial, it's a challenge. It can result in another, uh, uh, you know, another chain fork or whatever. But I understand there's a lot of pub a, a lot of tools. There's obviously, you know, second layer kind of things that can enhance privacy, uh, and there's a lot of other things that can that can be added. And I understand that Litecoin is adding Mimblewimble. I think that if if there's more of these kind of things that are uh, working with other protocols that then you know, hopefully they'll be, and I don't even know if technically that's a good idea or not, but hopefully something like that will be, will be implemented to Bitcoin. Um, and I think that, so the world is really complex now. And one of the good things about Bitcoin is that it can make the global economic world just that, global. And we haven't really had that before. It's very, been very hard to send money from country to country, very hard to move securities and things like that. Uh, Bitcoin makes it able to do that. But the world is a very complex place. There's nothing where you're going to have all of these different authorities agree. The government is of Israel and the government of Saudi Arabia, the government of Taiwan, the government of China, and the Dalai Lama are not all going to agree on who should be banned and censored. And the United States has relations with all those groups. So they're not going to agree either. Um, and so you need, I'm really a big believer uh, that you need a, a base layer that's really, really hard to censor and, and as close to immutable as possible, and also that enables people to build the privacy on top of it. And then in their, maybe in their own jurisdiction, China can make a rule that says you can't have this sort of wallet, or they can restrict internet transactions or whatever. But at least if the base layer is, is truly private, then you know, you have the ability for activists or other people kind of off the grid somewhere to be able to transact. And I think that's really key for a, for a free society. And, and we've got to make that a huge priority, in my opinion, if we can technically do it. I spoke to Paul Peely about two weeks ago, and I know that you're an advisor in Edge Wallet. And he told me that if privacy ends up being an option in Bitcoin, then it's pointless because it's going to be just like Zcash and a lot of people take pride nowadays in the fact that Bitcoin is auditable and they can prove that any transaction happened. But at the same time, it's terrible because you're revealing how many Bitcoins the person who sent you a, an amount actually owns. And unless you know how to do UTXO management, it's just terrible because it reveals the funds of everybody else involved in trades with you. And if there's going to be just a small amount of transactions that are private by a limited number of individuals, they're going to be easy to identify. And it's right. easy to do analysis on the blockchain and see this transaction was private. And these people are known to be privacy advocates. So it's just a matter of figuring out who is who and who sent to whom, as opposed to being by default and having privacy from the first moment when you make a transaction, which is a much more powerful tool. 
Yeah, I like the idea of, you know, it's just like Tor, the, you know, there's been um, data that, you know, the, you can figure out if there's, I guess there's ways to figure out if you're in a small town. I mean, we, we're in a pretty small city, so it wouldn't surprise me if there's only, you know, 10 people running Tor at a time, or maybe one or something like that. From what I understand, you know, that can be, you know, kind of like, kind of like uh, Bitcoin, if you're one of the only people using privacy. I think it's better as a default if this stuff is, is, is used by everybody. And I think that, you know, that's where advocacy comes back into play. There's, I think we need to have some pushback against global governments that they have the right to this privacy. When I became a stockbroker in 1992, I could open a, an account, it was just ending. So it was, it, was, it was right at the beginning of my career, you know, it would have been just before I started, especially like 91 or so. You could open an account over the phone. I could call you up say, hey, buy 100 shares of IBM, and you could say yes, and I could just write your, just your name down, name and address, and then you had a week to pay. And I didn't need your ID. Uh, it wasn't even until a little bit after I started, it was probably late 92 or something, I would need a little more information like your date of birth and stuff. And then later they said, okay, now you need your social security. And then they said this, and then they said, uh, okay, now you need an ID. And, and a lot of the older brokers just freaked out. They're like, ID? It's going to kill my business. What the hell business is of ours to ask for an ID? It would be like going to a, somebody selling milk right now. If you went to the people selling milk and say, okay, from now on, anytime you sell milk, you got to have an ID. And the old stock brokers are like, well, what are you talking about? What do I need an ID for? They want to buy IBM stock. That's their business. That's their money. If the IRS thinks they're cheating on their taxes, let the IRS chase them. I'm not taking an ID. And there was a big uproar about it. But you know, the government just slammed its fist down. And, and now, 20 some odd years later, it's, it's like the government has this, this, you know, birthright to, you know, forget about your ID, you need, your, you know, two forms of ID and your social, and all this other information. It's like, well, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, the economy worked just fine for decades and decades without this. Most of this stuff has no economic value. It's, it's, it's frankly, put in place because of fear over, you know, nonsensical issues, worried about, you know, fear mongering with, with, you know, terrorism or whatever. Um, and it's, I don't think it is the right of governments. And, and they've, they've got so much now, they know so much information about it that they can combine with the Facebooks and the other data aggregators and other things like that, that I think it's a real priority for us to fight back on people and say, you know, wait a minute, you, you, you should have a right to be able to move your money around and, you know, the, you know, the people arguing it for it really just want more power and authority. Uh, you know, Ben Lasky and the bit license and everything, you know, he, he used terrorism as an excuse and, you know, they'll use human trafficking as an excuse. But these things are, are very, very small um, pieces of the economy relative to uh, the benefits of having privacy. You know, government uh, violates our privacy all the time. I, I would like to see more people pushing back. Unfortunately, a lot of that, you know, there's laws in place, the Patriot Act and some of these other things. It's not something you can just be an activist against. You actually have to change the law. And there's not a lot of groups. I don't know of any industry group that's really actively trying to fight these things, but um, it doesn't mean we should give up. I think that's the way we should go. We should be, you know, pushing back on these things and make it the way it was, you know, 20 years ago or so. Um, I, I can't, I don't think you can really argue that all this, this obsession with AML, KYC, it's all brand new stuff, you know, it, it, it's, and I don't think you can really argue that it's made things better. It's slowed things down immensely. Bitcoin would be, I don't even know where it would be if you didn't have all these, imagine if you had, didn't have all these regulations about AML, KYC for Bitcoin, and you didn't have the um, money transmitter rules, and you didn't have the bit license. I mean, the industry would be a lot, a lot bigger, it'd be a lot more easy for people to move things around. And I mean, you just think of the, you know, the jobs and the efficiency and everything that's caused by this stuff. I think that we really got to push back as citizens and, the, you know, not to beat up, beat on the cyberpunk manifesto all the time, but um, that's exactly what it said in there. You, you know, you make code that can do this. The technical is the, is the best solution. If you can make technical solutions, that, that enable people to do this, that's the best way. It's probably easier than trying to change laws. And in some countries, forget about changing the laws. There's, there's countries where being a blogger is illegal, where being gay is illegal. And uh, they're not gonna come around to, to something that, that allows privacy for people to accept money. So it's our job to make uh, technical solutions. And if you're in a country like the United States, at least make it so the government doesn't try and squash those solutions 
so that you can you can protect uh, you know even if it's activists in other countries you know having that privacy is huge. Yeah, I think Coin Center is one of these advocacy groups which helps at least promote and maybe advocate for the issues of Orwellian the Orwellianism in the financial system. And you said that you don't show the ID to the milkman when you buy milk, but actually if you pay by credit card or debit card, they're going to see in the receipts what your name is and what your right. account number is. So you're revealing a lot of data when you decide not to pay in cash. Yep. Yeah, and Facebook can see if you have if you have uh, location enabled on your phone, they can see when you when you walk into the milk store, they know they know when you're buying stuff. And and you know, there's certain depending on how much data you've given away, they may know they're going to know where you live. They know when you go to the store, and they know how much you spend. And and you know, a lot of times these groups share data, so it really is um, you know, as we have all these benefits of this crazy digital world that we're in, it's really exciting to be able to talk to people all over. But we do have some some serious uh, privacy issues, uh, and I think they've only, you know, fortunately, most of the abuse has has been just companies trying to sell you something, which isn't that bad, really. Um, and it can actually be good if you have really targeted ads. Uh, but but there's a lot more nefarious uses of that privacy that people can do to get into people's lives and business and wallets and 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 use use against people. So hopefully that'll be, uh, you know, something we can fight back with better privacy tools. Yeah, I didn't think about this much, but it just struck me right now that in the 90s, people were very much concerned with paying with credit card over the internet. And we had a shot with David Chom's DigiCash, who had this idea to only reveal the kind of data that is relevant for the transaction that you're making. And if that became a standard in the banking system, then I guess nowadays, maybe, possibly after 9-11, we, we would still have more privacy than we already do. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see, um, you know, the Patriot Act was a big one. You know, there was, there was the, um, uh, you know, there was a couple money laundering things that came out before that. I'm trying to remember the exact time frame. I remember in my career, like I said, a few years after I started was when they, they, they first had these things. And then uh, a few years after that was 9-11 where everything changed. About within a year after 9-11, you had the Patriot Act and it just totally upended our industry as financial advisors where you needed you know, all, kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of information. And that's driven by the banks. And there's also you know, regulatory pressure. It's, I always forget the name of it, Operation... Um, Choke point, I think it yeah, choke point, where the banks had all this pressure from puritanical government bureaucrats who just said, well, these certain industries are legal, but we don't like them. And it was like, um, you know, anything to do with marijuana, uh, uh, you know, sex workers, um, pornography, legal pornography, these kind of things. Although it's legal to, to be a webcam uh, model. Uh, the government, certain government bureaucrats said, well, we don't like this. So they made it so these people had to become un unbanked. And that's very, very, very dangerous. You know, you combine that with some of these other things, you know, this, this trend of cancel culture and this, uh, you know, concerns about, uh, you, you know, who is doing hate speech and what organizations should be banned and things like that. That's a very dangerous road to go down because it's, it, you know, we're kind of like this far away from somebody being able to say, you know, okay, uh, Bitcoin Magazine is the hate publication. It, it's 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 hateful and harmful to the banks, and the banks are a cornerstone of the economy, and that's terroristic, and they shouldn't be able to say these things. And I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's it's not that far, you know, it's not that far removed from what you're already seeing. You have people who are deplatformed, uh, and and you have um, you know just the, these you know really bad uh, combination of things that's happening when it comes to to freedom and free speech. So it's, it's sort of fundamental with the banking system itself. You know, you have all of these, all these regulations that I, I just think are very, very hard to change, but you can just sort of create a new, better system over on the side. Uh, and you still have some, that's what I'm seeing with securities. You have some, you know, base regulations, but at least all of the stuff that's piled on top of this over the years, that's sort of not part of the regulations you can ignore. Uh, so hopefully that, you know, I, I'm really optimistic. I think it's one of the 
only hopes for humanity if we if we continue down this road where we have no privacy and government and corporations know every single thing about us because of these you know surveillance devices that we all are addicted to carrying around in our pocket um you, you know technology is the only hope really so do you believe that bitcoin in the end after it becomes private and fungible should become much more of a mean of exchange than it is now yeah i think it would be i mean particularly if you could get people using it more so that it becomes it, it's already its own system but right now a lot of it is focused on on ramps and off ramps and that kind of goes with bitcoin by itself is is uh you know more, much more private than the than the your, your classic fiat rail system where your identity is tied to everything um so if bitcoin you know, it has more privacy and more usage and you see it using as, you know, the settlement for more things, you know, I want to see it be used for settlement for, for the global securities market uh, and your coffee. Um, then, you know, in a perfect world, people are earning Bitcoin kind of privately and they're transacting it privately and they can comply with whatever government jurisdiction, you know, rules there are in their own jurisdiction about what they have to report or whatever, but at least they have more control over it um yeah i think that could could really help adoption and there there's a lot of legitimate needs that people have for privacy and maybe if we see more erosion through you know what we're seeing with with the government and social media and the regular media if they continue to erode our privacy maybe we'll you know people will take more uh you know take that more seriously i mean one one of the other things that's been good about being in this community is that i think we're all a lot more security conscious than your average person. I mean, your average people don't even use two-factor, you know, but your average Bitcoiner not only uses two-factor, but they don't use SIM two-factor. They use, you know, the, the, and they have redundant devices and different fake phone numbers and fake addresses and things like that. Um, just because we, you know, we're more security conscious. But if, if people have their privacy eroded, maybe you'll see more people doing that kind of thing. And that definitely, you know, hopefully will fit well with Bitcoin, using it as, a, as, you know, using it more often for those people who want that kind of privacy. But it, like you said, it's, it's not there yet because you have these um, organizations like Coin Analytics that can, uh, you, you know, they can find out quite a bit from a Bitcoin transaction the way it is now. So we definitely need to have some, some changes in the way things work for that to be realized. Also, I guess we need to educate Bitcoin holders to not order stuff on websites like Amazon and give their home addresses because that leads to a kind of record which associates their Bitcoin wallet with an address and a name and that will end up doxing a lot of other people who transact and who transacted with them. But anyway, yeah. my, my last question for you is, are you coming to the Bitcoin 2020 conference in San Francisco, which takes place in March? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't have that on my schedule, but it looks really good. Um, I, I'd love to uh, see if I can, I, I can work it. Uh, it, it I, I, I've seen some of the uh, posts on it. It looks like you've got a great group of speakers there. So yeah, we have I'd Tony Hawk. Like to check it out. What's that? Well, we have Tony Hawk. Cool. And Nick Sabo. Yeah, awesome. So it's going to be great. Yeah. Consider yeah, this some kind of invitation. All right, cool. So Mr. Fenton, this was really great. And I feel like I've learned a lot during the last hour. And I'm happy that you took your time to talk to me and do this interview. So thank you very much. This is really fun. Well, thanks. Thanks for everything. And keep up the good work. I mean, you guys have been for a long time have been, uh, you know, just a, a fixture in, in, you know, at the, the center of this whole world, you know, in the broad crypto world, Bitcoin is uh, you know, like I said, by far the, the, you know, the most important technology in this whole industry. It's the ultimate blockchain. And you guys have been the ultimate publication in covering that. So, you know, good work on that. The Bitcoin Magazine podcast is a BTC media produced podcast on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find us on Twitter at Bitcoin Magazine, and you can find out about other engaging shows we produce by subscribing to our feed on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.